Hello everyone. A very important thing to understand is what the resurrection body is like and what happened to Jesus in terms of the nature of his resurrection body when he rose from the dead. I want to start by reading for you from 1 Corinthians 15.45. Let's first have a look at uh, verse 35, 1 Corinthians 15, 35. And here Paul says, someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? So here in 1 Corinthians 15, he's explaining what the resurrection body is like. He's going to try to explain to us what it's all about. Okay? So this is a really good passage to have a look at if you, you know, if you want to really um, investigate this. Because that's what he's explicitly doing here. Verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, life-giving spirit. Okay? Now there's something that Something kind of funny happens here with a lot of people, and I've seen this happen a lot of times, is that when people, someone will quote this verse, and the next person will go to Luke 24, Luke 24, 39, when the risen Jesus meets the disciples, and Jesus says this, See my hands and my feet, that it's me myself, I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And then so someone might say, well, see, Jesus is not a spirit. Okay, but you have to stop and think about what you're doing if you have done that. Because that essentially is just a way of nullifying what Paul said. If, if, if someone quotes to you 1 Corinthians 15.45, where Paul says, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, and then you quote Luke 24 to say, no, that's wrong, you're nullifying the scriptures. So you have to sort out what this means. And Paul explains it. He explains it. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 13.4 there. He was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, and he's speaking about the bodies that humans have naturally, there is also a spiritual body. In other words, the resurrection body is a spiritual body. And then he says, we can call this spiritual body life-giving spirit. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, why is Paul saying that? Why can we call the resurrection body life-giving spirit? Jesus crucified body was raised up and clothed and consumed by the Holy Spirit of the living God. And that's why Paul is saying this. Take a look at verse... Let's have first have a, a look at verse 50. I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So what's he, what's he saying there? That 
This physical body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No, he's talking about this physical body in this condition, this perishable condition, this natural condition, this weak condition, all the words that he uses here, this mortal condition. That's what he means by flesh and blood. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Okay, see what he's saying there? Flesh and blood is the perishable. And then he goes on to say that we must be changed. We must be transformed. These bodies must be changed. They must be transformed. Not abandoning one body for another, not exchanging one body for another, but transforming the same body. Making it better. Making it fit for the kingdom of God. And... In this example that Paul is giving here, this description, he's using Jesus' resurrection as an example of what our resurrection will be like. It's very important to see this. Here's what he says in verse 53. For the perishable must put on the imperishable, or be clothed with the imperishable. The mortal must put on immortality, or be clothed with immortality. But when this perishable will have put on, or be enclothed with the imperishable, and the mortal enclothed with immortality, then will come about the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We'll see in a minute at 2 Corinthians 5, it's death swallowed up in life. What is swallowing up what? Well, death that is swallowed up is our bodies are going to be swallowed up, consumed, swallowed up, swallowed up by what exactly? The Spirit of God. And that's why our bodies will be put, we will put on immortality. We'll be enclosed with immortality because the Spirit is life. John 6.63 Romans 8 You can see the same thing at 2 Corinthians 3. The Spirit is life. And when the Scripture uses you know, life-giving Spirit or the Spirit gives life, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is getting at here is that when Jesus rose from the dead, He was clothed and consumed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. He inherited this in His resurrection. The divine nature. Spirit. Holy Spirit. God is Spirit. That is His nature. That is what He is. Our Holy God is Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit because He's a Holy God. Peter says we're partakers of the divine nature. What's he talking about? We're partakers of the Spirit. You can see the same phrase in Hebrews 6, except it says partakers of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit is. It's the divine nature of God. And I think most people really intuitively know that. Although Trinitarians need to deny it for the sake of their doctrine. Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the divine nature of God, or... The converse, the divine nature of God is the Holy Spirit. And that's why you see Paul contrasting walking according to the Spirit against walking according to the flesh. Walking according to the divine nature as opposed walking according to the human nature. Right? <clears throat> and so you say, well, where do you get the idea that it's the Spirit that you know, consumes us and clothes us in our resurrection. Well, first of all, stop and think about what gives us life now in our walk. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what gives us our life, right? And that's what gives us our life in this walk. New life. Born again of the Spirit, walking according to the Spirit, and having that life in the Spirit. 
Why do you think it would be any different in the resurrection? Just take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look at the things which are seen, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. He's talking about our future resurrection hope. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, 5 1, 2 Corinthians 5 1, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, if we're killed or if we die, we have a building from God, a tent, a house from God. Our body is our house. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house, in this mortal body, we groan, longing to be clothed. See, there's that clothed idea again. With our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as, as we, having put it on, or having been in clothed, we will not be found naked. This mortal body must be enclothed with the spirit. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. It must be clothed. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. See that? Consumed. Our bodies are going to be consumed, swallowed up. Now he who prepares us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a deposit. It's right there, friends. It's right there. To be clothed with the Spirit of the living God in our resurrection, that's what gives us immortality. That's what makes us immortal. It has, it has to be that way. To be immortal, you have to have the life of the Spirit. This is extremely important to understand because it helps you understand how Christ can be sitting at the right hand of God and be in you. It helps you understand verses like Colossians 2.9. All the fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. Well, yeah. He's clothed with God's spirit. Does that make him God? No. Nope. That's what makes him truly God's son. And that's why Acts 16.30-33, to 33, referring to Jesus' resurrection, Paul says, the second psalm is fulfilled. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Referring to Jesus' resurrection, he had died to that first life in which he was born in Bethlehem to come to life again. He was begotten again. And that's why we can be begotten again in him, born again in him. He was begotten again to a new life, resurrection life. And so when we're born again in him, we're born again into his resurrection life of the Holy Spirit. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 this is, this is really, really, really important to see. It's important to see your inheritance as a child of God. You know, if we, if we think of, of glory as glowing really brightly in the heavens, I think we all can agree that Jesus is going to shine pretty bright, brighter than anybody else. But Paul tells us here that we're, we're going to um, end up the same way as Jesus did in our resurrection. Our resurrection bodies are going to be like his. The fullness of God is going to dwell in us bodily. Even now, Colossians 2.10, it says we are made full in him. Look very carefully at a couple of other things. At 1 Corinthians 15.45, Paul says, The last Adam... Life-giving spirit. Okay? The resurrected Jesus is life-giving spirit. 
when he's talking about the, the new Adam, the last Adam, the second Adam, he's talking only about the risen Christ. Because the risen Jesus is a new kind of humanity. A divine humanity. An immortal humanity. And it's a divine humanity because you're enclosed with the Holy Spirit of God. Consumed by the Holy Spirit of God. Inheriting the divine nature of God in the resurrection. And that's what's going to make you a true child of God. Truly. Now we're children of God in as, in as much as we walk according to the Spirit. It's about what we do, how we walk. Then it will be about what we are. Then it will be a noun thing. Now it's a verb thing. It's how we walk. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And look at what Paul says here. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, life-giving spirit. Look what he says in verse 49. Verse 49. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, Adam, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, the risen Jesus. The image and this is how Jesus is in the image of God. You read, he's the image of the invisible God at Colossians 1.15. Right? And you read the similar things uh, at Hebrews 1.3. It's referring to the risen Jesus. He's the radiance of God's glory because he's enclosed with God's spirit. He's wrapped in. The love of his father forever, forever. Just kind of remember Joseph and his coat of many colors he got from his father. That's a picture of Jesus. It's a typology. He's the image of God's being. Yeah. He inherited the spirit. The spirit and Jesus' crucified body became one. New creation without horizon. A new kind of humanity. The first fruits of the new heavens and earth. Praise God. What God promises for us is unimaginable. Unimaginable. But the spirit of the Antichrist can't accept that kind of thing. It's the reason the Jews killed Jesus. That spirit of the Antichrist that could not accept a human being could be a son of God. Same idea. Same thing. Let's have a look at um, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now I have some other videos on this, and if, if you're not catching all this, what I'm about to say, just go look at my two other videos on 2 Corinthians 3.17, please. In verse 17, Paul says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit. If you check the context carefully, you'll see that it's, it's just undeniable that the Lord here is Jesus, and the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Check the preceding context, check the following context. There's no way out of that one. In fact, Paul goes on to say, a few verses later, we preach Jesus as Lord. Just read it. And remember, there's no chapter and verse divisions when Paul wrote this letter. It's just one long stream of letters. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. What same image? The Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. Keep reading. Forget that chapter division is there. It wasn't there when Paul wrote this letter. Keep reading into chapter 4. Okay? And look what Paul says. Um, verse 4-4. Four, four, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. You don't want that to be you. So they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What was he just talking about? The glory of the Lord. The glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? Why is he the image of God? 
The Lord is the Spirit. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, life-giving spirit. He was consumed and clothed by the Spirit of the living God, his God and Father. And he's wrapped in the love of the Father forever. Think about all that. He's wrapped in the Spirit of the Father. To be a true son of Adam, or a daughter of Adam, or a child of Adam, we need to be flesh of his flesh, don't we? And to be a true child of God, we need to be spirit of his spirit, don't we? If we are going to be truly, truly his son or daughter. Spirit gives birth to spirit, John 3. Yeah. God is truly making us his true sons and daughters. As true as Jesus is his son. As much as Jesus is his son. Jesus will always be the firstborn of many brothers. That's something that none of us can ever have. His glory will shine always brighter than any of the rest of us. We'll never come close. But we're going to be true sons of God in the resurrection. Look at Romans 8. Look at Romans 8. And it'll start to even become more clear. What's he talking about in Romans 8? He's talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs, heirs of God. It actually says heirs of deity in the Greek. And fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of this creation eagerly awaits for the revelation of the sons of God. That's us, if we're born again. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of he who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Think of the responsibility that you have. Think of it. If you're a child of God, the creation is going to be set free from its own slavery through the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting our sonship, the redemption of the body. The redemption of the body. We have the deposit of the Spirit now. A deposit of the Spirit now. The fullness of the Spirit bodily when we're raised from the dead. Take a look at this very, very, very carefully. It's very important. There's a premise in Trinitarian doctrine that if you have the divine nature of God, then you are God. Completely, completely false. And it prevent, it's like a roadblock that prevents people from seeing what I'm talking about here. It blinds them. If I have the human nature of Adam, and I do, does that mean I am Adam? Most definitely not. Nature is one thing, identity is another. But I need to have the human nature of Adam to be a son of Adam, don't I? And I need to have the divine nature of God to be a true son of God, and that's exactly what he is giving his children. God doesn't go halfway, and he doesn't do things half-baked. God does wonderful things for his children. God bless you.